Well, this morning I want to look with you at the greatest sermon of all time. I'm talking about Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. So turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Now, many people throughout history, including even a lot of non-Christians, have agreed that this is the GOAT of all sermons, the greatest of all time, the greatest sermon ever. It's only three chapters long, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and so most have concluded this is merely just a summary of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. I mean, if you sit down and just read the three chapters, you can read them in 10 or 15 minutes, and I guarantee you, Jesus wasn't about preaching for 10 minutes. I'm sure the original Sermon on the Mount was probably hours, if not days, long. So what we have here in Matthew 6, 5, 6, and 7 is a good summary, probably, of the greatest sermon of all time, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Now, the best leaders know how to cast a, a vision that inspires and motivates us, right? Think of some of the greatest speeches Take, for instance, Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech, right? And how in that speech he cast a vision, he gave us uh, an image, painted a picture, if you will, of what we should strive for, what the world should look like. One of the things he said, if you remember in that speech, he said that in, in his I Have a Dream speech, he said, I have a dream that my four little children will one day, he's talking about the future, casting that vision, will one day live in a nation where they won't be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. So great leaders, these great speeches, these great sermons have a way of painting for us a, a, a perfect world, a, a vision for us that we can strive for, that motivates us, inspires us to try to achieve, to realize that vision. So what I'd like to start out doing this morning is just walking through Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. There's 10 things I want to pull out of it rather quickly, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, just so we can get an idea of this perfect world that Jesus has in mind. I want you to try to capture, just like the original audience there, when he gave this sermon, the vision that he was putting forth of what the world should look like. First, imagine a world with no anger. Take a look there in Matthew 5, verse 21. Matthew 5, 21. He said, you've heard that it was said to our ancestors, do not murder, and whoever murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Whoever says to his brother, fool, will be subject to the Sanhedrin. But whoever says, you moron, will be subject to hellfire. Now, obviously, what he's referring to is the Old Testament law, right? Right? The Old Testament law, over 600 commandments, we usually celebrate and um, think of it as summarized as the Ten Commandments, right? But the Old Testament law had over 600 commandments that covered pretty much all aspects of morality, and this is one of the key ones, right? Murder, thou shalt not murder. But Jesus takes these commandments and he, he takes them to the whole a whole different level. He goes beyond merely the externals and drives down into the, into the heart attitude. Imagine, if you will, a world where kids at school don't rip each other to shreds with teasing and body shaming. 
Imagine a world where people didn't attack others on Facebook. Imagine a world with no racial slurs. Drop down to verse 27. Matthew 5, 27. Imagine a world with no lust. Jesus said, you've heard that it was said, do not commit adultery, another one of the Ten Commandments. But I tell you, again, driving to the heart of the issue, our heart attitudes, everyone who looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, I think we need to clear up some confusion here. I work with a lot of young people on college campuses, and there's a lot of confusion about this verse, both with Christians and non-Christians. And a lot of people have misinterpreted this. They've come away from this thinking that Jesus here is condemning all sexual desires. And that clearly can't be the case. Jesus is not condemning all sexual desires. In fact, the Bible is fairly clear God gave us sexual desires, and they're a good thing. In fact, the Bible encourages and celebrates sexual desire. We won't turn there, but you can jot down, read later, Proverbs chapter 5, and of course, the, the Song of Solomon. The rated R section of the Bible, right? So it's clear God approves and even celebrates sexual desires. Here what Jesus is doing is he's condemning sexual desires that are out of control. We all know what happens when sexual desires get out of control. Imagine a world where people controlled their sexual desires and focused them on their spouse alone. Imagine a world with no porn websites. Imagine a world with no rape or incest. Imagine a world with, with no human trafficking. Drop down to verse 31, chapter 5, 31. Imagine a world with no broken families. Jesus said it was also said, whoever divorces his wife must give her a written notice of divorce. But I tell you, he takes it to the next level, but I tell you, everyone who divorces his wife, except in the case of sexual immorality, causes her to commit adultery. Again, imagine a world where children didn't have to wonder if it was their fault that mom and dad don't love each other anymore. Imagine a world where there are no uh, illegal and financial messes caused by broken marriages. Imagine a world where moms and dads don't use their children to war against each other. Let's move on. Jump down to verse 33. Take a look at verse 33. Imagine a world with no lying. Again, you have heard that it was said to our ancestors, you must not break your oath. You must keep your oath to the Lord. Verse 34. But I tell you, don't take an oath at all. Drop down to verse 37. Instead, let your word yes be yes and your no be no. So imagine a world with no 100-page legal contracts. Imagine a world with no contract lawyers. Sorry, Joel. Is Joel here this morning yet? <laughs> but imagine a world where when somebody says they're going to do something, they do it. Imagine a world with no gossip. 
Take a look at the next one, verse 43. Jesus is painting this picture of an ideal world, a perfect world, how the world should be. Look at verse 43. Imagine a world where people loved their enemies. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you instead, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So imagine a world where people assume not the worst of others, but assume the best of others until they get all the facts. Imagine a world where there's no us versus them, where Democrats don't hate Republicans, where Republicans don't hate Democrats. Imagine a world where politicians don't invent lies about their opponent to get people riled up and and draw folks to their side. Move on to chapter 6 now. We're quickly breezing through this greatest sermon of all time. Chapter 6, verse 1. Imagine a world with no prideful religious people. Jesus says there in chapter 6, he says, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of people to be seen by them. Otherwise, you'll have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give to the poor, don't sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be applauded by people. So imagine, if you will, imagine a world where people gave Not because they love themselves, but because they love others. Imagine a world where there's no hypocrites at church. Drop down to verse 19. Imagine a world where people didn't hoard wealth. Jesus said, don't collect for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy where thieves break in and steal. But instead, verse 20, but instead collect for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves don't, can't break in and steal because where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Imagine a world where uh, rich people freely gave to the poor. Imagine a world where corporations cared more about people than the bottom line. Imagine a world where people chose, instead of to buy the new iPhone, to feed a needy family for a month. Drop down to verse 25. Matthew 6.25, imagine a world with no anxiety. Jesus said, don't worry about your life, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, or about your body, what you're going to wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Just look at the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they? So imagine a world, again, where there's no need for Valium or Prozac. Imagine a world where men don't self-medicate at the bar at nights. Imagine a world where people aren't frozen by fear of losing their job or, more commonly, fear of not keeping up with the Joneses. Move on now to the last chapter, chapter 7. Jesus is painting this perfect world, if you will. Imagine a world where there are no judgmental attitudes. Chapter 7, verse 1. Jesus said, don't judge so that you won't be judged. Verse 3. 
Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but don't notice the log in your own eye? Verse 5. Hypocrites. First, take the log out of your eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So imagine a world where people don't think that they're better than others just because they struggle with different kinds of sin. Imagine a world where people don't use the weaknesses of others to make themselves feel better. Imagine a world where you're not harassed by self-righteous people who think they're better than you. And lastly, the tenth one that I want to draw your attention to, chapter 7, verse 15. Imagine a world with no evil religious leaders. Jesus warned in verse 15, he said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. They, they look very good. They put on good appearances, but inwardly are ravaging wolves. You couldn't ask for a clearer description, a more vibrant picture here. Jesus says in verse 16 that you'll recognize them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree produces good fruit, but a bad tree produces bad fruit. You'll know them by their fruit. So imagine a world where religious leaders don't take advantage of their flock. Imagine a world where pastors didn't drive Ferraris and fly on private jets. Imagine a world where religious leaders don't try to create huge followings merely to further their own selfish ambition. So quickly, as we just walked through the Sermon on the Mount, we didn't cover all of it, of course, but I, I hope you can see now this, this ideal world that Jesus is putting forth, this, this vision he has of how the world should be. It's all very inspiring. It's very motivating. And there's been you know, thousands, if not millions, of sermons preached on it at that level. The inspiring, motivating aspects of this greatest sermon. But if that's all that it did, if all that it did was motivate us and inspire us, it would be only a good sermon. If all that it did was just encourage us to try to live this vision out, it wouldn't be the greatest sermon of all time. It would merely be a good one. What makes it the greatest sermon of all time is that there's a deeper purpose going on here. What makes it the greatest sermon of all time is that there's an underlying purpose that Jesus is trying to achieve by painting this perfect world for us. By giving us this vision, by showing us how the world should be, Jesus helps us realize very powerfully, that this world is far from perfect. By painting this picture for us, Jesus leads us to ask, why is our world not like this? What is wrong with this world? And of course, the answer is very simple. What's wrong with the world is me. What's wrong with the world is you. The world isn't perfect because we're not perfect. And I think this, this deeper purpose, this underlying purpose that Jesus has here in the Sermon on the Mount can best be illustrated with a story I've heard about lifeguard training. Now, believe it or not, I was a, a lifeguard in high school. Uh, many moons ago, I worked as a lifeguard in the summers. Uh, 
And this wasn't an experience of mine in lifeguard training, but I have heard um, from different people that this happens sometimes when they train lifeguards. And what they do is they, they take the lifeguards in training and they have them one at a time go out, whether it's a lake or a pool or the ocean, they have them go out and try to uh, rescue a person who is pretending to be drowning. Okay, it's not an actual drowning, but somebody goes out there and everybody knows it's pretend. But as part of their training, they're sent out to try to rescue this person who's pretending to be drowning. It's crafted, though, it's set up in such a way that it's an impossible task. So maybe the person is bigger, the person who's pretending to be drowning, they fight against the rescuer. They just make it impossible for the lifeguard in training to actually rescue the person. And it's frustrating for the lifeguard in training. And sometimes, to make it even more extreme, the instructor says, look, until you can rescue this person on your own until you can go out there by yourself all alone and rescue a person who's drowning, you cannot be a lifeguard. And so maybe through their training, several times they're given this opportunity and they fail. It's set up this way on purpose. They fail again and again and again. And it becomes frustrating for the person. They want to be a lifeguard. It might come to the very last day and the instructor gives them a deadline and says, today is the day. If you can't rescue the person now, you fail this training. You, you will not be a lifeguard. And so they're sent out one more time by themselves to try to rescue this person. But again, they, they fail. It's so difficult. And after they experience that failure one more time, it's then that the instructor explains, you're supposed to fail. We wanted you to experience the frustration and the danger even and the hopelessness of trying to rescue someone on your own. Because more than just verbally telling you, we wanted you to experience and know that you can't do this on your own. That it's impossible to do this by yourself. And the best way for you to learn that was through experience. And then, you know, in the midst of the lifeguard training, the moral of the story is always take a life preserver. Always take a flotation device. Don't do it by yourself. It's a hard lesson to learn, but it's a powerful way that they will never forget their life preserver when they go to rescue someone. And I think I'm convinced that this is exactly what Jesus was trying to do in the Sermon on the Mount. Yes, he paints a perfect world for us, but I believe the primary purpose he had was to help us understand that we fall short. That the world is not perfect and it's our fault. It's not God's fault, it's our fault. It's our moral failures, it's our evil choices that have caused the world to be what it's like. One of the reasons I'm convinced of this is something he says right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. He says to be perfect. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. I mean, come on. Just be like God. Just be perfect. It's clear that he's setting the bar so high. This should cause us to cry out, I can't. It's impossible by myself. It's impossible. I cannot. I am a moral failure. And so the appropriate response to the greatest sermon of all time, the, great, the, the appropriate response to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is not, I'm inspired, I'm motivated, I'm going to go try my hardest to live like this. Instead, the appropriate response is, okay, I see now what perfection looks like, and I realize I'm not even close. I'm not even close. That's the main underlying purpose here. 
Jesus wants us to understand that we are not perfect. I think the appropriate response to the Sermon on the Mount can best be seen in the story of the rich young ruler. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew 19. Matthew 19, starting in verse 16. A lot of times, I think we read this and we view this encounter maybe as a failure on Jesus' part. But I think he accomplishes exactly what he wants to accomplish here with this rich young ruler. And in fact, the rich young ruler responds how I think we all should respond to Jesus' teaching, Jesus' sermon on the mount. Take a look, pick up at verse 16. Just then, someone came up and asked him, asked Jesus, Teacher, what good must I do to have eternal life? Jesus replied, Why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who is good, little foreshadowing there, little key to Jesus' deeper purpose. If you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Very similar to what he said in the Sermon on the Mount, right? Jesus is going through the greatest commandments of the law and, and, and painting a picture of what it's like when people keep them. It says the same thing here to the rich young ruler. Uh, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, love your neighbor as yourself, etc., etc. And the rich young ruler doesn't get it yet. Verse 20, he says, I've kept all these. Really? What do I still lack? And so he, even though he's confused here, he still seems to think or understand that he's not quite perfect. So good on him. So Jesus says, this is the same Greek word used in Matthew 5, 48. In verse 21, Jesus uses it again here. He says, if you want to be perfect, there's that word. If you want to be perfect, like God, Jesus said to him, go, sell your belongings and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. And when the young man heard that command, he went away grieving because he had many possessions. You see, at first, the rich young ruler didn't get it. He thought he could be perfect on his own. In fact, he thought maybe he had achieved perfection because he had kept, at least externally, all these great commandments. But he had to learn, and this is what Jesus was trying to help him understand, and I think what Jesus is trying to help us understand through the Sermon on the Mount, that we're not perfect, that we fall short of God's perfect moral standard. Jesus, of course, being God himself, knew the best way to help the rich young ruler understand this, and so he says, if you want to be perfect, then go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor. And that is what helped the rich young ruler realize that he's not perfect. He goes away, he leaves the encounter grieving, but I think that's where we should be. That's what we should respond to with the Sermon on the Mount, that it should cause us to grieve when we realize we don't measure up, that we are moral failures. Later, when Jesus was talking with his disciples, he explained to them this deeper underlying purpose. Take a look at this. Jesus said to his disciples, I assure you, pick up in verse 23 there, Matthew 19, 23, Jesus said to his disciples, I assure you, it's, it will be hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Basically, it's impossible. He's, he's just using exaggeration to show how it's impossible. And it's not just the rich, right? Poor people have other things that they struggle with, that they fail at morally. The point he's making is that it's impossible for anybody to get into heaven. And the disciples understand that. The disciples understand the point he's trying to make, that it's impossible 
for anybody to get to heaven. Because you can see there in verse 25 that they're overwhelmed by this. Take a look at their response, verse 25. When the disciples heard this, they were utterly astonished, and they asked, well, then who can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, with men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. I think that's the the deeper underlying purpose of the Sermon on the Mount. The primary lesson there is that it's impossible for us to live out this perfect moral life, this perfect moral world that he gave us a vision for. He's done that to help us understand that we are moral failures, to help us like the rich young ruler, to realize that we're not perfect and to cry out to God that we can't do this on our own, that we need his forgiveness, that we need him to perfect us. Now, the rest of the New Testament explains how this works. Turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 3. There's just two other chapters I'd like to look at with you this morning. Galatians 3 is the first one, and then we'll close by looking at Hebrews 10. But I think it's best to understand the rest of the New Testament. What I'm talking about is after the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I think it's best to understand the rest of the New Testament, Paul's letters, James, Peter, Revelation, you know, all those books after the Gospels, it's best to understand them as like a commentary on Jesus' teaching. In other words, it's the Holy Spirit, God, writing to us in the rest of the New Testament books, helping us and explaining to us what Jesus meant. Because some of these things, just let's be honest, wouldn't make sense until after the cross, And so think of the rest of the New Testament as like a commentary helping us understand Jesus' teaching. And that's how we're going to look at Galatians 3 here. If you take a look, starting in verse 2, Paul is scolding Christians in Galatia. He's scolding them. He says, I want to learn this from you, kind of sarcastically. I only want to learn this from you. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? After beginning with the Spirit, are you now going to be made perfect by the flesh? There's that word again, the same Greek word, perfect, perfection. Do you think you're going to be able to be made perfect on your own by the flesh, by working at it yourself? You should know better than that. Paul says, no, that's foolish. And he goes on throughout the rest of this chapter, Galatians chapter 3, he goes on to explain the purpose of the law, which again, we summarize and celebrate as the Ten Commandments. Jesus drove them home beautifully in the Sermon on the Mount, but Paul here explains the purpose of the Ten Commandments, of the Old Testament law, that the purpose of them is to point out our imperfections. Take a look, drop down to verse 10, Galatians 3.10. He explains that all who rely, trust, if you will, put their faith in, all who rely, all who trust on the works of the law are under a curse because it's written, everyone who does not continue doing everything written in the book of the law, is cursed. And this is the point, again, from the Sermon on the Mount. That to be morally perfect, you have to follow everything perfectly. Not 612 of the 613 commandments. All 613 commandments perfectly, or else you are a failure. Verse 11. Now it's clear that no one's justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. But the law is not based on faith. Instead, the one who does these things will 
have to live by them. Verse 13, Christ, though, has redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Because it is written, everyone who is hung on a tree is cursed. The Old Testament law, which we summarize as the Ten Commandments, and the Sermon on the Mount shows us that we fall short, that we can't follow God's moral law perfectly, that in other words, we're cursed, that we're condemned because of our moral failures, our imperfections, if you will. But here's good news. Even though we are moral failures, all of us, every single one of us, God still loves us. And so what God did is he crafted this master plan to have his son, Jesus Christ, rescue us from this curse, rescue us from this condemnation that we deserve for our moral failures by taking on the condemnation himself. He paid the penalty for our moral failures when he was hung on a tree, the cross. And Jesus promised that if you stop trusting in your own efforts, you stop trusting in what you can do to try to earn your way to heaven, but instead rely on what he did, put your trust, put your faith in what he did for you, then your moral failures will be forgiven and you'll be welcomed in to heaven. This is exactly what happened to me in 1994, it's one of the years where I was working as a lifeguard. I was a teenager, and some of you might know, Jeremy and Iris Gooding sat me down and talked to me and asked me this question. They asked me this question that changed my life. They said, if you were standing before God right now and he asked you, why should I let you into heaven, what would you say to him? And I'm so glad they asked me that question because it changed my life. And I answered, much like the rich young ruler, God's going to let me into heaven because I haven't killed anybody, I haven't committed adultery, I haven't robbed a bank. I thought I was pretty good as a 17-year-old kid. But they explained, using God's word, that... I fell short of God's perfect moral standard. That I had to come to grips with the fact that I was a moral failure. That I had faith that I was trusting in something to get to heaven, but I was trusting in the wrong thing. That I was trusting in myself, what I could do. And they said, no, What you need to do, according to the Bible, is you need to trust in what Christ did for you. You need to put your faith in what he did, not what you think you can do, which you can't. And so it was that night, February 4th, 1994, that much like the rich young ruler, I came to grips with my moral failures and turned to God, cried out to him for forgiveness, and I trusted him to forgive me, rescue me, and make me perfect. Take a look. I want to do one more thing here in Galatians 3 before we close in Hebrews 10. But drop down to verse 22. Paul goes on to explain how the purpose of the law is to point out our imperfections, to help us understand that we shouldn't trust ourselves, but what Christ did for us. Look at Galatians 3.22. It says, The Scripture has shown, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Gospels, the Scripture has shown how everyone is imprisoned under sin's power so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Before this faith came, we were confined under the law, imprisoned, if you will, until the coming faith was revealed. The law then, which we summarize, celebrate as the Ten Commandments, was our tutor, like our teacher, until Christ, so that we would be justified by faith in him. Verse 25, but since that faith has come, we're no longer under a tutor. 
for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Obviously, he's writing to those who are Christians. And so he's reminding them, because of their confusion, even as Christians, that it's Christ who makes us perfect, that we can't ourselves, that the law is merely our tutor, our teacher, to point us to Christ, to instruct us that we can't shouldn't trust ourselves, but to trust what he did for us. One last chapter. Flip over in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. I want to land here because, again, we see the same Greek word for perfection being discussed. Hebrews 10, starting in verse 1, and as I'm sure you're aware A large part of the Old Testament law was animal sacrifices. That was how God instructed them to go about their worship through animal sacrifices. And this verse here, just verse 1, explains that this part of the law as well, these animal sacrifices, could never make anyone perfect. Look at Hebrews 10.1. Since the law, again talking about Old Testament law, Ten Commandments, the law was only a shadow of the good things to come and not the actual form of those realities. It can never perfect, never perfect the worshipers by the same sacrifices they continually had to offer year after year. And then drop down to verse 11. He goes on to explain how the Old Testament law, the animal sacrifices in particular here, can never make us perfect. But he goes on to explain how we can become perfect. Verse 11. He says, every priest stands day after day ministering and offering the same sacrifices time after time, which can never take away sins. But this man, verse 12, this man, Jesus, he's talking about, this man, after sacrificing, offering one sacrifice for sins forever on the cross, sat down at the right hand of God. Verse 14, for by one offering, by dying on the cross, he has perfected forever those who are sanctified. With man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So how are you going to respond to the greatest sermon of all time? How are you going to respond to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount? Are you you just going to walk away from it inspired, motivated, trying to accomplish his vision for the world? Or are you going to respond like I think he wants us to? Are you going to respond like the rich young ruler, to walk away grieving, understanding that you're a moral failure, that you by yourself can't be perfect that you can't earn your way to heaven on your own. I want to urge you, as we close here, not to trust your own efforts. Maybe you know a lot of things about the Bible. Maybe you grew up like I did at the church, and you knew a lot of things about Jesus. You know a lot of things about God and and theology. But your faith is in the wrong thing. You're trusting in the wrong thing. I urge you to make that choice, make that decision to trust not in what you can do, but in what Christ has done for you. Because again, he promised that if you trust in him instead of yourselves, your moral failures will be forgiven and you'll be welcomed into heaven. That God himself will perfect and transform you to be like him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your word and we're thankful that you communicate these hard messages to us. That you have entered into history to help us realize how fall that we fall short of your moral perfection. I'm thankful for your word, Lord, and I'm thankful for your mercy and your grace and your love, that you loved us and continued to love us in spite of our failures. 
Thank you, Lord, for your promises that we can trust in you and what you did for us. We're thankful, Lord, that you're working in these broken, imperfect sinners to make us like you, to make us perfect, morally perfect like you. We're not there yet. We have so far to go, but we're trusting you to continue the work that you began in us through faith as we trust you as our Savior. In your name we pray, amen.